Happy New Year's Eve! We are going to count down moments, comics, movies, every from the entire decade for you. Including how the world of TV was reshaped by our comic book properties and favorites. Frankly, so much has changed in a decade. The world looked very different in 2010, and I'm just glad 2008 wasn't included because that is the dangerous year to talk about. So from 2010 <laughs> through 2019, it is New Year's Eve, and I am very excited. Mr. John Roke is joining us today. Thank you all so much for having me on. It's always fun producing the show, but it's even more fun being in front of the camera and talking <laughs> comic books, superhero movies, and TV shows with you guys. I always love it. And you have, We've you got have only 10 years. We got this. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're totally, we're totally. Breezy, flying yeah. through. Flying it's a through. 10 minute show, one minute per year. I no. sent the notes yesterday. I was like, guys, just fill in the blanks. What are your favorite movies, TV, and moments of the decade? Easy. Cue existential crisis for all of us. <laughs> oh, yeah. So this is episode 338. Ooh. It is New Year's Eve. We are 12 weeks away from 350 gambits involved somehow. <laughs> it's going to be a beautiful cover. <laughs> now, I want to start with movies because I feel like movies really change the structure of everything this decade. Comic book movies have changed forever. They are the most popular, I would argue, thing in the film medium. Yeah. So that is new because frankly, <laughs> new. as 08 to 09 changed around, it wasn't even Disney Marvel yet. It was still like distributed by Marvel Studios, all that madness. So since 2010, I'm just going to list the movies I think are most impactful. Now, these are not necessarily my favorite movies, but they're the movies I think impacted the decade the most. For me, Winter Soldier, changed the game. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, Deadpool, Logan, Joker, and I had to include Avengers, so I did six. Avengers in parentheses. <laughs> All right. Corey went to the Amy school of I made the rules and now I can break them. <laughs> uh, I also attend that school, of course. So uh, my picks to talk about this decade and how everything changed, Wonder Woman, Avengers, Black Panther, Logan, and Scott Pilgrim Ooh. versus the world uh, with an honorary mention of Spider-Verse. Nice, I, nice. I too am cheating. Um, I will start off with everyone knows my favorite comic book movie now, Logan. Uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, certainly Black Panther, certainly Wonder Woman, and I went specific, Avengers and Game, specifically changing the game, I think, going forward into the next decade, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, and sure, I'll put Joker in parentheses. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll play count. along, I'll yes. play along. The, the five, six game. <laughs> so uh, I, I want to kick it off with, we all included quite a few of these, so I'm going to do the, the ones that are not in the all three of our lists. Sure. So I'm going to start sure. off with Winter Soldier. For me, Winter Soldier was when they announced Robert Redford and when that first trailer came out, when they made a full-on 70s Harrison Ford espionage thriller, mm. that was the moment I knew that more people would start jumping on. More people would be available to the genre because we'd seen a lot of really good moments in these films. We'd seen a lot of really strong integrity of film, but when they advertised it as an espionage thriller and then it followed through and it also expanded what villains could be. That movie had three comic book villains, but it also had the idea of subverting all expectations by having the government out for Captain America. Right. So for me, that was planting the seeds of like, no, no, this genre is serious read a comic book, it's not kid stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. And also like the muted costume, the way they handled that movie. And it was a Russo Brothers introduction. So mm -hmm. for me, Winter Soldier was uh, more of a zeitgeist shift that, that I think we'll look back on in 20 years, like in those giant books of like, in the 2010s. Uh, did you guys, uh, is Winter Soldier still up there for you? After it all these movies? It absolutely is. Uh, like I, on my list, I just put Avengers on there because <laughs> it's my cheating representation. Like Black Panther's mm. also on there, but like this decade was the decade of the MCU coming into its own and kind of dominating. Uh, and we don't know what the future holds. Like along, right. we, we got several great DC movies in this decade. We got a bunch of X-Men movies, some of which I loved, some of which were less successful. But when you look at the 10 years strung out as a whole, those moments where the MCU broke through in different ways over and over again mm -hmm. uh, are, are what really stand out. And Winter Soldier is absolutely one of those where people were like, it can be this. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a great point. Exactly how you ended there, Amy. It can be this. It's not just, and this has always been the knock, right, on superhero films. Oh, it's people in tights and they make the jokes or whatever. But, you know, Dark Knight kind of opens the door. Mm -hmm. Iron Man opens the door a little wider. Mm -hmm. And then you go into what is the um, what the results of that opening of the door in 2008. 2000, the entire decade of the 2010s <laughs> is the result of that door opening the way it did. And you had to keep upping the game in order for this uh, medium or this genre to survive over this decade and flourish the way it has. Certainly Winter Soldier is one of those big strong footprints in the MCU, but in the superhero comic book world 
overall because it showed you they happen to be superheroes, hmm. but the spy stuff is real world stuff. The idea of uh, our privacy being violated, the idea of people who take the idea of protecting a country a little too far and violate our civil liberties in the process without us knowing it, how far are we willing to go? Those kinds of conversations in Winter Soldier are what we used to read in the comic books mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. And yep. to see them pop up on the big screen, which is why we love those comic books, to see it pop up on the big screen is a massive deal. And, and the fact that it achieved that victory Victory by being faithful to the ideas Absolutely. contained in the source. Not one specific story, because a lot of it's obviously drawn from Bruce right. Winter yeah. Soldier app, but it's a, a app? App? What am I trying to say? Run. Winter Issue Soldier. 338. Oh. App this. Uh, <laughs> there we go. It's a different A word. Uh, yeah, that, that run obviously informed most of what we saw there, but it's drawn from multiple sources. And yeah. I would argue it still has some of the best fights in the MCU. The, the containness of that film is, is like nothing else. And that elevator plus Batrock the Leaper. Uh, so yeah, for me, Winter Soldier's up there. And you guys okay. both included Wonder Woman. I want to talk about No Man's Land. I want to talk about the incredible <laughs> chemistry yeah. between Chris Pine and Gal Gadot. Like Wonder Woman has so many things. And for me, it was a great moment for DC to be like, no, no here. So Wonder Woman uh, it can't be refuted. What do, you, what do you guys think still five years later, four years later? I think Wonder Woman is like this, like David when he walks into the ring against Goliath. Everyone's like, no way. No <laughs> way. Everything we've seen before, it's not going to work. It's not going to happen. A slingshot? That's all you brought to this thing? <laughs> and so like you get, as if their task wasn't monumental enough to try to turn around the narrative that female superhero films don't sell. Right. Throw that on top that the entire brand is resting on your shoulders because they've kind of stumbled out the gate with whatever you feel about Man of Steel. It wasn't received well by some people, so they had that. Then they tried to fight back with Batman v Superman. Didn't really work. So you've got Wonder Woman coming into this, this and to try to fight all these narratives at once, pushing the boulder up the hill. Inadvertently, proving that a woman has to work twice as hard as a man <laughs> to get one. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of crazy. All you but... have to do is be twice as good. Luckily, this is not difficult. <laughs> it's it's for, not for Gal Gadot and Patty Jenkins. I mean. And <laughs> smile, God damn it. But no, you see what they did, and it was incredible, Patty Jenkins. It's incredible what Gal Gadot did. Incredible all the production team did, and succeeding, and succeeding to the way that nobody would have seen coming, and, the, and certainly hitting it right, because that translated into box office dollars, mm -hmm. and that really buys you cachet in this industry. And now everyone is seeing that Wonder Woman is actually the character leading the DCU now into the next decade. Agreed. And the truth is, of course, I think Patty Jenkins would be the first to say she's walking in the footsteps of a lot of people before mm, her. The movie sure. is very much also a loving tribute to the Christopher Reeve, John, Richard Donner, uh, Superman yes. movies. But it is, when, when you're looking at this decade as a whole, the reason I put it at the top of my list is... Uh, when, when we're looking back on the history of superhero films, the decade in which after 75 years, they made a big screen Wonder Woman movie. Yeah. Uh, which is, we will never be able to explain to future generations how obvious it should have been and how much in doubt people felt it was. Mm. Like, and I, you know, other people's doubt is infectious. If I don't think other people are gonna take a chance on thing, that can infect me. Even mm. though it's like, she's literally one of the most iconic superheroes of all time. It should be easy money, cakewalk, make a movie, make a movie every couple of years. Mm -hmm. And it took a long time to happen, but when it did, it was worth the wait. Totally agree, and I, I do think, much like Winter Soldier, we'll look back on that movie as like, well, duh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, now, yeah. another movie that's a well, duh for me is, of course, James Mangold made the Western of our decade. Yeah. Not even just comic book movie. I would argue one of the best modern Westerns, if not the best modern Western, that having a guy with six claws in it. I love Logan so much, and I love the black and white cut. I love that this movie has so much versatility. I love how rewatchable it is. I love how brutal it is, because I always felt like they made X-Men, comma, Logan, comma, and the X-Men movies, mm -hmm. and they finally let Logan be a Wolverine movie, so it, it made both things better. It let the X-Men breathe, hopefully in the future, and it let Logan be his own thing, and the story is brutal. The amount of depth in, in Charles's performance, the amount of hum humanness in every frame of this movie is is inarguably separate from how people perceive the genre. It's just a damn fine film. Logan, for me, is one of those movies where, like, if your grandpa doesn't like comics, you show him Logan. Mm -hmm. uh, after, it's only been a couple of years, but I still, I feel like Logan's timeless. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like that recently happened. Uh, how do you guys feel about Logan now? 
I, I noticed it was on all three of our lists. All three mm-hmm. of our lists made the cut. Uh, for me, I put it on my list not because Logan's necessarily, like, it, it isn't exactly one of my top favorite films. Uh, I mean, obviously, it is one of the finer comic book films that have been made, like, mm. uh, during this beautiful time of flourishing comic book films. But I think it's important in a way. Like, it's there. It's on my list because when you look at this decade, you have to talk about Logan and Joker and the advent of R-rated superhero <laughs> movies and the new directions that things are going and those patterns pathways to getting really interesting performances to Patrick Stewart subverting his own legacy as Professor X Mm. uh, which was I mean what you want out of stories is something you're not going to forget seeing that happen you're not going to forget the the beautiful storytelling and theatrical experience of encountering those very interesting takes and twists on things Uh, so I'm I'm very glad it exists uh, and it's in my top five yeah look it's my favorite superhero comic book film because it speaks to me at my age on so many levels uh and it really moves me i've seen it i don't know we're going on 50 times that i've seen this movie or since it came out you know it's just it's an obsession of my like if my girlfriend leaves the house it's on I just put it on to have background or whatever like it's just it is because it's one of these things it just kind of is it's just so eminently rewatchable it has a great story but let's also give it its due. When you talk about R-rated things, it's a great point you bring up, Amy, because just like us, when we started reading comic books, right, we're reading this, this, the cool stuff, the safe stuff, Dark Knight Returns shows up and it blows the doors off the game. This is that kind of thing. This showed that there was a taste for an R-rated film. And it was the Mandalorian before the Mandalorian <laughs> showed up, right? She, he's shepherding Lone the little- Cub. Yeah, that's it's right. All Lone it also it's Joker Lone exists. Cub. Without, I mean, without this, Joker harder to get made and exactly. Lone Wolf and Cub getting out there as the Mandalorian. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. You know, it's, just, it's all there. And you know, of course, Logan has samurai connections as well. Mm-hmm. Japanese connections as well. If you go and read the, the lore of, of Wolverine of Logan, uh, this is also Frank Miller and Frank yeah. Miller. Yes, of course. All these fantastic things that happened around Logan and James Mangold finally got they finally took the shackles off James and let him do the film he wanted to do as opposed to the second film x Minority, where he wasn't able to do what he wanted to do with Wolver- the Wolverine. Mm. And they took it like that last half of the movie or last part of the movie they took away from him and messed around with it. This is his version and it comes across so powerfully because the greatest thing is we have to once again to push it. You have to show what really happens. This is Charles at the end. This is Logan after something happened. We know what happens in Old Man Logan. They kind of referenced a little bit right. of it mm-hmm. and yeah. put it on Charles' shoulders rather than Logan's shoulders, which was interesting. It was. And, and then you go and you look at that and you go, okay, this something happened. Something phantom happened. People died. There's guilt all around. So it's not just what's on the page anymore. It's taking that story and going to the human next level that happens. Some of us have great lives and we live into our 30s, 40s, 50s, we have great events, but sometimes by our 70s and 80s, we're paying the price for the things that mm-hmm. we did back then and we look back and we have reflection. And I thought that was a brilliant thing to do with a comic book movie. The, the movie. two things that really strike me when I rewatch it are the moment where Charles says basically, uh, this is the, one of the happiest days I've had in a long time and I yeah. didn't deserve it, did I? And like the, the, that feels like onslaught, that feels like so many of the later Xavier stories. Right. And then just the feeling of being young, physically but old mentally that that Hugh goes through the entire mm-hmm. film that he's able to still do the things but he doesn't like he's done he's right. out uh and like you know your range your knuckles hurt like as you get up there like I still feel that like well, and as the as the uh the curtain call the the encore uh, mm-hmm. to Hugh Jackman's entire career as Wolverine, yeah. which like, Nine if movies. we were doing a multiple decade thing, we'd have to spend time on those Fox X-Men movies. Yeah. We, like, but looking at this decade and the impact they left, like his sort of, here's how it ends, mm-hmm. is uh, just one of those, before we had Avengers Endgame, the like, how are you gonna bring, how are you gonna make this multi-movie series add up to something, in this case, an emotional truth, yeah. right. and a beautiful performance. Yeah. For, for, you, can, for, can you confront the younger part of yourself, once and for all and close the door on that, of one of the mistakes you'd made in the past when you were younger, yeah. right? When you were more aggressive, when you were more whatever. And you're like, okay, as an older person, him confronting the younger Wolverine is that. But also the lesson of what he tells X-23 at the end, right? Don't let them define you. Mm. I let that, I let them do that. And that's what a father passes on to the next generation, says you don't have to be what they tell you to be. Go be you. And I think that's also kind of a subtle message to future superhero film directors. Mm -hmm. Don't let them tell you what the hell it is. Go and do something new and different. 
Now, for me to not want a Hugh Jackman teaming up with Ryan Reynolds because of how good Logan ended <laughs> is saying a lot. He and does say a lot. And it's impressive. I'm like, no, no, don't ruin Logan. <laughs> so speaking of that, we don't have time to cover Deadpool, which is also, we're going to get it on a giant size, but me to not include Deadpool in this opening. Deadpool's there in here. But uh, I do want to talk briefly about both Black Panther and Into the Spider-Verse. Yeah. I mean, come uh, on. I mean, before we get on to TV, we got to mention Black Panther, the first Best Picture nominated yes. superhero film, yes. a film that is I would say, inarguably, one of the most important films, Hard Stop. Mm -hmm. uh, I love what this movie speaks to. I love the layers of metaphor. I love that much like comic books, it subverts expectation in its bright shininess. And their performances are amongst the best in any film in the last five years, much less ten. Yeah. Uh, that movie holds up to me better upon rewatch. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel about it now? I love it. Yeah. I, this is a movie I could put on on repeat for the rest mm. of my life. Like, partly because... And that, but what that Best Picture nom is for is the award for everybody firing on all cylinders. Mm -hmm. If the script and the actors and the production design and the direction and the cinematography, if everything is going right, that's how you're supposed to get in that ring. Mm. And for me, that's what Black Panther is. Uh, and the fact that it's also a movie with so much meaning, so much richness, which again speaks to what we already know comics can do, but not everybody out there knows, and that it does it with folks who don't get movies of their own nearly right. often enough, and that it actually hit and broke through with everyone. I love that, I would love the movie either way, but but I love that I get to remember it both as one of my favorites and as wildly successful. That's really nice. Yeah. Not to talk about my other fave, Scott Pilgrim, that I don't get to remember that way. <laughs> We're full head to on giant size. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry again, Scott Pilgrim. Can't, can't, can't <laughs> echo what Amy said enough <laughs> other than to say it has to be on the, my list, at least, for the Best Picture nomination. That mm. matters. That pushes, again, the medium or the genre forward even more. So you have to respect that. And yes, all the compliments you've lauded on the film <laughs> and then some, yeah. And Killmonger and the soundtrack are still amongst yes. the best of Marvel, period. I love the villain. I love the, like, ah, it's just great. Uh, and then finally, Into the Spider-Verse before we get into TV. Uh, I'm not big on animation. I like it. I respect mm. it. I just don't find myself watching it. I have nothing against animation, but I haven't seen a lot of the animated Marvel. I haven't seen a lot of the animated DC. There's not enough hours in the day, frankly. It's not a disrespect. It's just time. But Into the Spider-Verse gave me that like oh am i missing out on so much yes i am into the spider verse is i would argue the best adaptation of what spider-man is to me like how i perceive spider-man what i loved about him growing up they managed to do with seven spider people uh so for me the spider verse is so delightful it shows the versatility of the character it shows how important the character is to so many people it juggles multiple villains it's inventive in in, in its writing and its animation and its editing in every single aspect of movie making to me into the spider verse is the most accurate representation of what art can be when you let the best artists in the world handle it. That movie is, that should have won the best picture. But uh, Into the Spider-Verse is, is very important to me. How does it hold up uh, after a year? Yeah, I, I can't watch it enough, to be honest with you. And one of the greatest experiences I had recently was putting it on, I, I went to have a, a get together with my uh, f f f girlfriend's family, right? The Christmas call, whatever. Sure. I'm there, I, you hit a wall where you're talking to the same people for five hours, eight hours, <laughs> and I just kind of snuck away into the television, which I was told I was allowed to do. <laughs> so I sneak off into the television, put on Netflix, put on Spider-Verse, just to kind of take my mind away from things. The kids come filtering in one by Aww. one and sit on the couch next to me, and we all have a communal experience of watching Into the Spider-Verse together. And you know, the parents come in like, what's going on here? I'm like, I'm just having a good time with the kids enjoying this. <laughs> and that speaks volumes that it appeals to us on multiple generations. For those of us who grew up loving the comic book movies, it brings you back to that time when you discovered them again. But also it's so innovative that it shows, or it, it shows you a new dawn for what can happen animation-wise as a feature film. Mm -hmm. And that's great. Yeah. Absolutely. You know the bite in Ratatouille where like the, the climax of the movie where the critic tastes the thing and he's instantly back in yeah. time? Yeah. Yep. Spider-Verse is like if that sends you back in time and forward in time simultaneously. Yeah. <laughs> Great point. Like, I just remembered who Spider-Man is and entered a new world that's unlike anything I've ever seen and right. I never want to taste anything else. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's delightful. It is near perfect. We can spend four hours on the movies of the decade because it's been a decade. But we have to look to the future as well and that includes this week's comic books. All right, the books are out for New Year's. Your local store is probably not open tomorrow. But go on Thursday and get these wonderful books. These are the books you can't get till Thursday. We're gonna kick them off with Daredevil number 16, Chip Zdarsky. Good God, man, how do you write so good? Lois Lane number seven. I'm sure her life is not a lot more interesting now that certain events have happened in Superman. <laughs> then we have Joker, Harley, Criminal Sanity. If you are under the age of 17 watching this show, it is a dark book. It is depraved. It is true crime. It is fantastic, but ask 
your parents. If you've been watching the show, this should already be on your radar because it is by friends of the show, Ashley V. Robinson and Jason Inman, and science mm. hits comic shops today. This next book, I need only say three words, and those words are Garth Ennis and Punisher. This <laughs> is a new Garth Ennis run of Punisher. It, uh, the first issue snuck by me. I've tried to get two and three to people's awareness. This is issue three. Pick up them all. It is a very good Punisher tale. All right. Anything what? jump out of you? Number one, the Daredevil one. Two Jesus, that arc. cover. Mm -hmm. I mean, and all the people involved in it, it makes it looks so fantastic. It has Sinkevich vibes to it. We were saying mm -hmm. off mic, and of course Punisher, both of those. Like that's you know, those are Roka books. I yeah, know, I can tell you. Uh, <laughs> He's you know, getting back in, it. folks. We're, we're yeah. converting him. We're gonna yeah. bring him to the dark side I'm of the wallet. That folder soon, I guess. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> the cover artist Tedesco is one to watch. Yes. If people have not learned his name, he is incredible. But yeah, it's it's not that big a week this week. But there's a lot of big stuff. There's new Star Wars. There's new Thor. There's a whole bunch of stuff hitting shops. This and week. last week the. Uh, the, a giant event book kicked off at Marvel and also a uh, new Venom arc started with Mark Bagley, one of my all-time favorite artists, uh, working with Donnie Cates, friend of the show. So it is a good time to be a comic fan. And if you're home with the family and you need the retreat, much like Into the Spider-Verse can bring, comics can also bring them. But you can also <laughs> bring those books out to your family, have a communal conversation. Comics are truly ageless. So it's a really cool thing to, to talk about what you're reading and your parents, we have your reading because you're reading. Uh, so <laughs> frankly, I'm excited that the holidays are here uh, as per the X-Men sweater. I am, I am ready to dive in, but before we have lots and lots of turkey, I want to talk about the TV of this decade, which mm. as much as film has been incredible, I would never expect many of the shows we got this decade to exist, much less be as good as they are. And it's, it's the advent of technology. It's the betterment of the society for like, you know, voting with your wallets, where your time goes. And it's arguably, it's it's studio execs realizing, hey, this thing can be taken seriously. We don't have to make a gosh shucks show. So uh, I want to run around just like we did last time. Yeah. Our most impactful shows of the decade. I went with Watchmen. Yes, it just happened. We'll talk about it for the next hundred years, much mm -hmm. less than the next ten. Next up, we got Daredevil. Mm -hmm. I am hashtag save Daredevil for life. When that show started, I didn't know something could be that good, and here we are. The Boys, once again, this year, giant year in comics, but I would argue The Boys is up there with a the decade. We've got Runaways, a show that showed that you can have 14 cast members all be great. <laughs> uh, then we got Legion, in-camera editing will never be the same, and then I've got, parentheses, because I made the rules so I cheat, The Flash. The <laughs> Flash is definitely on there for me. Good God, I miss Molly. Now, what do all you right. got? So I tried to get my brain around all of comic book based TV <laughs> for this decade and y'all who watched last week's show know that I ran out at 37 just trying to talk about this year so there's too much let's get that right up um, I cheated by making categories number one is <laughs> the Arrowverse the whole Arrowverse was born and took over our brains in this decade starting on 2013 in 2013 on the CW Followed by Marvel Netflix, RIP Marvel Netflix, 2015 through 2019, bringing us Daredevil and of course, Jessica Jones, which I think is a truly stunning achievement. Uh, this decade, and it took me a second to do the math on this, Walking Dead. Mm. Walking Dead is a huge deal and changed TV uh, and mm -hmm. comic books relationship with TV in a really substantial way. Uh, and then Watchmen uh, and Doom <laughs> Patrol because I love them so much and they represent prestige TV coming in and weirdo TV coming in in ways that I cannot wait to see reverberate through the coming decades. And my parentheses was the interesting, when we look back at this decade, we'll talk about the experiment that was the MCU TV ABC attempts mm -hmm. um, and a special shout out to Agent Carter. Yeah, I like that. Uh, all right, so mine is starting off, of course, Watchmen. I don't know where else you start, to be honest with you. It's the <laughs> culmination of everything that's come before is Watchmen. No way is this possible without everything that's come before. Uh, the boys really blew my, my brain out in terms of the abilities of what it can do on TV. Doom Patrol put my brain back together, made me laugh all through what's possible. <laughs> Legion really was an incredible show to show the idea of how an unreliable narrator can connect to this whole world and play around with multiple timelines. And The Punisher. I think The Punisher season one is the one that I really kind of hold on to still and still rewatch because it is the first uh, time that you've seen a superhero show address PTSD mm. and mental health issues and do it in a real way uh, and also be incredibly funny uh, with his relationship with Micro and all that happened to, with his wife and everything like that. There was a lot that, that there was enough play within the show that the brutality when it happened carried even more weight because it was so 
out of pace of what you'd seen before, but showed you that in the real world, yeah, this is all really possible. So I think since all of it is fantastic. And, and I wouldn't, I'd say that John Bernthal's up there with your Downey Juniors and your Ryan Reynolds as Hell the yes. cast. Like that is the most logical casting yeah. of all time. How did we not break his nose like John Romita did? Like John Bernthal's yeah. nose <laughs> is a piece of art. Uh, now we should, Truth. with time constraints, I think Amy's uh, parentheses are actually going to save the day. I like your cheat code here. Uh, so let's kick it off with Watchmen because that made all three of our lists. Mm. Yeah. It doesn't fit in any other world because it is a brand new show nothing should work about Watchmen being a show and nothing should live in that universe I enjoy Doom Patrol but don't do that to that universe mm. on TV uh, now what I've really enjoyed about Watchmen is it's brought in non-comic book fans mm. I was at uh, I went to Taco Bell yesterday because it's the holidays and I have some regrets but mainly happiness and everyone <laughs> in line behind me was talking about Watchmen and what was cool was two people started talking to me behind me and then the two people behind, behind them chimed in and then I was able to turn around and five of us strangers were wow. talking about Watchmen in a Taco Bell that's beautiful. I never thought that would happen, especially in that setting. Mm. So it was a really cool experience. They were talking about how some of them wanted 12 episodes, how I really appreciated the nine. We talked about the symmetry. We all showed each other's things we hadn't seen in the other's work. And all of us didn't know each other and were very different types of people, which was really cool. So for me, Watchmen is one of the more broad, holy crap, everyone can get into the show. And it appeals to so many types of people. Mm. And it's also one of the most highbrow pieces of entertainment ev out there because you have to, you know, there's a PDPedia you can dive into. <laughs> yeah. The novel is a literal novel. There's a lot of density to this work. So the fact that that's translatable to everyone is really impressive because it's not a light read or watch. Uh, it is only a week gone and I miss it dearly. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's hard to like culminate the decade, but I agree. I think everything led to this. Mm -hmm. uh, Watchmen briefly, how do I'm we gonna cover? I'm going to put a stranger on blast right now, but it's an adorable blast. Uh, but to the wonderful lady who called the shop the other day and asked, like normally when, when comic book things come out, it can be really tough where someone's like, I liked Avengers, what do I read? Mm -hmm. And you're like, ooh, Okay, I need to know a lot more to figure out how to direct you. <laughs> I got a phone call at the shop, which is now one of my favorite phone calls, of someone who sounded like they knew how tough this was going to be. <laughs> and they were like, hey, are there any comics that, you know, tell the story of, like, the original 80s Watchmen? And I was like, lady, <laughs> I have exactly what you need. Your name is on it. It is behind the counter. Please enjoy. Uh, it is a, an absolute thrill because it's weird to me to imagine people coming to this in that order. But mm. that's what you want to happen. That's what you hope will happen. Uh, they, The book and the show are very different, but I never thought I'd be so grateful mm. that someone made a TV show <laughs> that is a sequel to Watchmen and then lied their butts off about whether it was a sequel to Watchmen just long enough for us to get super on board. Use uh, that holiday money on Watchmen. That's what she's saying. <laughs> Yeah, it was great. <laughs> yeah, oh no, I, I don't know what more I can add other than to say that this is what you're supposed to do. Take the spirit of something that came before. If you're going to tackle it, you take the spirit of something that came before and you honor that spirit, what mm. you create, but you find a new and inventive way to bring that spirit out and put it in a different context. The racial context of Watchmen is one of the gutsiest things I saw in 2019 in the entire decade, I'll be honest with you. Maybe even in the entire, so far, the century so far. Like, it just was so gutsy the way it handled it. And I wonder if there is a season two, what parameters they set up for that that'll be just as fulfilling or can be just as fulfilling, I don't know. But I, you have to savor this for what it was. And it's right, it crosses over. I, I know people who have never read a comic book, who watched Watchmen and were like insane about it. And we had these great conversations, right? And then there are people who read all the comic books and are just like, well, what? Oh, this is great how they attach this. The Geek Buddy, the podcast that I do, the Geek Buddies, I mean, Mike and Shannon and I, are, we're just massive fans of the Watchmen comic book. We've shared it many times. So to see it come to life like this, breaking down every episode was one of the joys of the last three months, honestly. And it gives me hope that we can make things really smart, really dense yes. and still be accessible. It gives me hopes that studios are gonna be like, oh, we can, Right? And that, that I'm very excited. Uh, now, speaking yeah. of incredible writing and being very niche, that did way better than I expected. Five years ago, the Marvel Netflix universe kicked off with Daredevil. We all included a Marvel Netflix property yeah. on our list. Uh, we got Daredevil. We got Jessica Jones. We got Punisher. We got Iron Fist. We got Luke Cage. Mm. We got the Defenders for a second. Now, for me, Daredevil is even including the MCU like as a whole. My One of my favorite Marvel adaptations. Mm. Uh, the guilt they were able to translate, the likability through mm. the guilt. Like, Matt Murdock kind of a prick sometimes. And Charlie Cox was able to play both sides of that. I was also some of the best fights in any medium, TV, film, anything. And the entire 
entire time I believed in vigilantes. I believed when he's chained up to a chimney with the Punisher. I was like, how am I believing this is actually <laughs> happening in New York? And and having the Kingpin have as much screen time as Daredevil yeah. in the first season, there's so many risks and so many bold choices. Even the costume, when he went out of the all black, which I loved, and went in full Daredevil mode, I was like, people are gonna stop watching. It's a comic book show. No, no, three seasons. So, and then we got Jessica Jones, who was actually an alcoholic full of rage. <laughs> we got Punisher. Another who, sensitive portrait of PTSD, but in a different way yes. that like, I mean, I had definitely never seen on, on, on conventional TV, much less superhero TV. Mm. Luke like, Cage introduced more musical artists to my Spotify pantheon than any other show has this decade. Mm. Uh, there's so much about all of these shows that is really unique. Uh, there are even nice things to say about Iron Fist. We'll get to them on the giant size. We'll find them. Uh, so <laughs> I, what, I, what do you guys remember now that it's that it's over, now that Marvel TV is, is becoming Marvel Studios? Mm. It is truly the end of an era, but 2015, 2019, we had some great stuff over there. Uh, I think what I come back to with Marvel TV is that, look, the, the film's are great but the films also feel like above things and mm. event things this is all the way down to the blood and guts the earth of the foundation of comics right you bring it all down because none of these people except for luke cage and and jessica necessarily have like overt superpowers right, right? punisher is just a soldier daredevil is just a blind guy who can do martial arts arts but the humanity with it that's the thing that crosses all those shows the humanity and the struggle of real life things that they can't always solve by a punch or a bullet or uh you know a well-timed uh, whatever daredevil throws uh, <laughs> uh, you know uh they, they, they actually have to negotiate these things that's why i think karen page has been the mvp mm -hmm. of the daredevil series for yeah. me because she's the one that's had to do it without any of that extra stuff and had to negotiate it without any of that extra stuff so that was the thing that i'll always take from these that they felt accessible and real and gritty and dirty and i loved it because it made me feel like there's another avenue to explore here in superhero fandom or superhero watching that doesn't necessarily have to be out in the cosmic universe or massive superpowers so i love that so the, an interesting thing about uh, talking about the marvel netflix years alongside especially like the growth of the arrowverse on the cw is mm -hmm. that they were two different kind of proof of concepts for serialized interconnected uh superhero mm. storytelling yeah uh and they obviously do different things they have different tones they serve different audiences to a certain extent but uh, I, those are a lot of what I'm going to remember. Like the, even the, not every swing that they took in the Marvel Netflix shows worked for me, mm -hmm. but they were always trying to do things that push that forward, make mm -hmm. interesting out there choices, but serve the humanity of the characters and serve up moments of interconnectivity that you can only do in settings like this. Mm -hmm. And that are so rewarding. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't think like I, defenders is not on our top of the list thing, but they, the moments of those universes being connected. Rosario Dawson is connective tissue. Yeah. Karen Page is connective tissue. The lighting is connective tissue. I'll yeah. never forget the lighting in the is Defenders. Is Rob Morgan connective tissue too? Is, did he show up in multiple uh, I think so. MC, Marvel TV shows? I thought he did. Which Maybe part not. is he? I'm so sorry. I'm oh, he's, he's the he's the uh, lower voice black guy. He always Daredevil runs into. The, the guy, he's literally in all six shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He's, <laughs> all six he's shows. the thug. Oh, what was his name? The thug that was like yeah. always on there, like he's like dealing drugs oh, off Turk. by the. Yeah. Turk. Yeah. Turk. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Turk is in everything. Turk is in everything, right? I do Turk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rob Morgan, I knew. Yep, Turk, <laughs> thank you. Turk, thank you. You really, and also I love that Turk always felt like the guy that Spider-Man would take to jail. Like oh, he was totally. a character that you were like, he would pop up in an Iron Fist right. comic and a Spider-Man comic. And he's always like, uh, uh I, I like that those felt like the comic books to me. Uh, yeah. I, I love that the movies- It's a corner of Marvel that we all know the flavor of that yeah. put across to a huge audience that we were like, oh, you're doing the street level. It was even broader <laughs> than Marvel Knights by the end because the movies I agree feel like the event comics. The movies feel like the giant, like War of the Realms. Whereas the, the show always felt like something I could have every night to go home to like a comic book yeah. and just dive into and that is irreplaceable Which, and I'm really excited for the MCU let's shows. Face it, they were just taking Bendis' Daredevil run where Luke Cage and Jessica Jones were stopping by and being like that but TV and we're like yeah. <laughs> I mean I'm not mad. No. Uh, now we also we had we got to do a lot on Giant Size because frankly time but we also had yeah. two of us included the boys on here didn't get to talk about Joker in the movie section we will on Giant Size but the boys to me was holy crap adult content can be this good mm -hmm. but also this intelligent because there's a lot of really tricky stuff in the comics that I, I enjoy the comic, but wouldn't have translated as well on TV if they hadn't handled them so delicately. Yeah. And there's a lot of really important messages in the boys that I didn't think would translate as well because the way they handled the show was art. 
the way this show comes across is truly sensitive while also being very bold. It's very, like, it's kind of like the pegging scene in Deadpool. Like, if you don't care about the sensitivity <laughs> of the character, you don't care about the gore and violence. Like, there's got to be a man under the peg. So I really like uh, that the, the boys really captured all of the seven while also making Wee Huey and uh, Carl Urban, oh, wait, I can't remember his name right now, uh, human. Everyone in the show is human, even the inhuman characters. And it's brutal. Uh, I love the boys. I know we both included it in yes. our... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, the fact that they cleaned up uh, for 2019 the story of the boys and didn't lose any of its potency, mm. didn't lose any of its effect, I thought was brilliant. And you are cheering for Starlighter so much mm -hmm. more than you even did in the comic books. Mm. And I didn't think that was possible, but they set up in such a brilliant way and they make you understand both sides of this paradigm, uh, whether you wanted to or not. Whether you want to understand homie here, like having weird attachment issues and mom and dad issues, but look, if you were raised in a in a test tube, essentially uh, a crib, uh, how, why, why would you be? You know, those kinds of things are like, oh, I have to actually have understanding for the villains or mm -hmm. have some sort of level of compassion for the villains. Ah, damn, what are you doing to me? So all of it, as you said, Coy, very real, very truthful, adult, mature themes, uh, and didn't pull any punches and had no fear in doing that. And I would appreciate that madly. And I like how it played with the comics chronology where if yes. you've read it, it's like volume one, volume six, volume two. It And I never knew it was coming, but it was all true to the comic yeah. while being inventive. And if you don't like gore or violence or language, or this isn't your subject matter, The Runaways does a lot of the same stuff very well. You care about the villains, you care about the leads. You don't know who the leads are. There's 14 cast members. It's all very good, yeah. but it's a little, it's a it's a tamer if you're not into the hyper violence. Now, before we get into giant size, we're gonna list quickly our five, moments of the decade that I think change things forever and then we're going to dive into them on the podcast. For me, the moments are Avengers Assemble. He finally said it and it's the culmination of freaking 20 plus movies. Spidey coming home when uh, Sony and Marvel made that deal that changed everything. Joker clearing a billion I think will be talked about in box office reports for years to come. Deadpool's entire marketing campaign was the most Deadpool thing we've ever had and mm -hmm. it was perfect. And of course Daredevil's debut on Netflix. Um... I want to save mine for Giants Ask. We're out of time. We're 35 We're minutes, 35 Corey. 35 minutes. We you see what happens thing. when the Whiteboard of Justice is over here? He's making sure. I'm Guys, I got excited. It was a decade. We could get away with I'm it. I'm just, three and a half minutes per year was impressive. I'm going <laughs> to pat myself in the back. All right, guys, so tune in to Giant Size Heroes. It's going to be on this Thursday. We're going to go into all the movies, TV shows, and moments we couldn't there. And we're going to have special guest John Roca on the podcast with us. All Thank of you. us on the podcast. So tune in Thursday. It's been a glorious decade. Thank you for sharing this review with us. Thank you for sharing the decade with us. And keep reading comics to the next decade is just as glorious. And until next decade, stay sweaty. <laughs> Happy New Year. <laughs>